Well, good morning, everyone. I don't mean to interrupt any of the visiting going on. I love to see this. This is great. Um, but I want to welcome everyone here, and uh, it's wonderful to see all the faces. Those of you that are able to join online, I see you metaphysically, <laughs> and I appreciate that you can get in connected as well. A few things I would like to share with you this morning. Uh, locally, we have just a couple announcements. Um, first thing I wanted to mention is that there is a um, two of the ki kids in our school over here are eighth grade, and they're going to be graduating this year. Um, I forgot to ask Melissa. The graduation is the 27th, correct? Yes. Is it a open invitation, or is it not? Do you know? As long as what? Okay, so May 27th is the graduation for the two students at the school this year. And as Melissa said, uh, it's an open invitation here. Okay, <laughs> I'm getting confirmation. <laughs> um, but uh, certainly we'll have to concern, be concerned about uh, physical spacing, and so we'll just have to be keep, keep an eye on that as well. Um, but that's May 27th. Uh, Margie had a quick announcement. Good morning, church family. I just wanted to let you know that again, it is time for the baby bottle program for Next Step. So they take the funds that you donate to buy. They have like a little store. So they have baby clothing, diapers, small little like car seats and types of things that these young moms need. And they actually earn those gifts by watching videos, doing lessons on learning how to be a parent. So it is a very good program, and they help some of these couples uh, stay together and raise the baby together. So I have 11 of these. So if you want to stop by after church and take one home and fill it up, it's like Mother's Day to Father's Day. It's a collection time. So I'd appreciate your help with this wonderful program. Thank you, Margie. Some uh, announcements from our uh, conference that I want to bring forth. Uh, there is at Gem State an outdoor art and music show on May 20th. That's going to be at 530 over there. They, um, it is outdoor, but they are asking for masks to be worn. Uh, there's also with Gem State a, a golf tournament that is uh, happening on May 16th. I don't have a whole lot of information about that, but I'm sure that you can do a search for Gem State online and get to their website, and they'll have information there. Also, the Idaho camp meeting is kind of getting close to those seasons. Idaho uh, conference camp meeting is going to be held June 8th through 12th this year. The theme is Remember Gethsemane, and uh, Pastor Lee Venden is speaking. They are going to have a different format than what we've seen in past years where they have uh, the, the speakers speaking in the evenings and on Sabbath. Um, again, um, if you want more information about that, go to the online website, idahoadventist.org is their uh, um, conference website, and you can get more information about that. Today's uh, um, offering is going to be for uh, a church budget. Now I want to read a little bit that came here it says, when a church comes together, what seems impossible can become possible. When each family gives what they have, the Lord's work moves forward. Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. Deuteronomy 16, 17. So today let us come together and give our wonderful God what he has blessed us with. I had a personal thought I'd like to share, if I can make this thing work. There it goes. Uh, Hebrews 13. I got the right, yeah. All right. Let love of the brothers and sisters continue. Do not neglect hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Uh, this is something I've been uh, thinking about a lot lately, just trying to keep in mind that uh, 
Um, when we uh, see people, we need to uh, really recognize them. We need to see them and recognize that they're there. These things that we have been wearing on our faces feel like a barrier sometimes, a wall. But, you know, all it is is a piece of paper, a cloth. Um, it, there's nothing there that prevents you from uh, saying hi, smiling with your eyes, whatever it takes. So we need to remember to to look and greet and make an extra effort. And I'm not trying to bring any pandemic politics or anything into this. No, it's, it's just more than ever, we, we really need to connect with people. And um, regardless of the, the masks, we can, we can definitely do it. Um, you know, there's, we, we ask for certain stipulations at different times, and um, we definitely just need to uh, um, keep in mind that of grace and uh, uh, helpfulness. The elders in the board continue to evaluate different measures as uh, we understand them to be, and that's really all we can do. So I want to thank you for being here today. I want you to know that I see you, and I recognize you, and I appreciate each and every face here and those that are able to connect in online. So let's please join me for a moment in prayer. Gracious Lord, we do love you. We appreciate you, and we know you've promised to be here, Lord. We seek to lift you up, Lord, to glorify your name and to worship you here today. So, Lord, please uh, be with our service here. Help it to uh, move along very smoothly. And uh, um, we, once again, thank you for being here. In your gracious name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, Jack had some things he'd like to share with us today. Just a reminder this morning for you to um, keep praying for our other church, for witnessing opportunities. And remember, God has called each one of us um, to witness in some way. Um, and as James pointed out last week, one part of witnessing is service to others. Um, and a I'd like to show an illustration of that. If keep uh, Carol Ann and Jody and Margie as they serve in community um, services, the people that they meet, that the Holy Spirit will lead them to, um, you know, maybe some interest um, and um, other possibilities. Um, sometimes we can um, witness by just praying for people when we know that they have, you know, some struggles in their life, some problems. Um, uh, it's a, a little unseen thing that you can do, but it counts. Um, the Lord will look on that. Um, remember, read Romans 1, 14. Paul talks about being obligated to preach. Now, maybe each one of us isn't um, necessarily preaching a preacher, but we do have the, um, the opportunity to witness in some way. As you're praying, ask God to lead each one of us. Give us wisdom that we know um, and follow the Holy Spirit's leading as we are um, talking with neighbors, talking uh, in our work, um, you know, other places where we meet people. Um, see those little signs that um, will help us. I noticed that I um, appreciated the Sabbath school lesson this week because it talked about Abraham and how his descendants, and we're just, spiritually we're part of that descendancy, if you will, we were supposed to be a blessing, so search to see how you can bless somebody else. Next week we'll talk about salt and how that interacts in our life. Thank you.
Thank you, Jack. One other thing, uh, Arla asked me to mention that there will be a, a gathering of uh, people over at the school this evening at 4.30 to 6.30 for some uh, light games and such in an uh, appropriately distanced manner, that sort of thing. But uh, if you can come over, that'd be good to see you all. 4.30 tonight at the school. Uh, let's see. I had a quick story I'd like to share some thoughts about, and this is for the, the, the young at heart, you know, sort of thing. Like we all are, of course. <laughs> anyway, um, is there anyone here that finds darkness to be a little bit unnerving? <laughs> I know some of us don't want to admit it, but uh, certainly uh, uh, it's not all that uncommon to be a little nervous when it's dark, okay? Now, my twin brother, he uh, didn't like darkness growing up, but never really bothered me, with a caveat there. Um, but uh, uh, I do always have appreciated looking up and seeing the stars at night and all that. I will admit, though, um, my grandparents have this bathroom that has no windows, and when it got closed in and it was dark, I found that to be unnerving as a child. I Just one of those places I just didn't like very much. Um, the thing that we have to look at, I, I talked a little bit last time I was up here um, about light, and we uh, talked about prisms and how lights are uh, um, uh, separated into multiple pieces. Today I want to talk a little more, uh, less scientific about it. Um, so, uh, God gave us light, ultimately. Uh, you know, he, right there, at the very, very beginning, he, he said, let there be light. That's what it was, and boom, it was there. I think he was planning ahead, knowing that we would prefer it that way. <laughs> among other things. Um, since that time, we um, have used our, the brains that he gave us to come up with many different ways of, of coming up with light. Probably the first thing we saw was, was just general you know, flame and got a little bit of a, a light that way. But, you know, it's... It's easily diminished, easily hidden, can be blown out pretty quickly. You know, there's some limitations to that. So we then uh, found oil and gas type lamps and we tried to improve upon that and, and uh, came up with different ideas that way. And then, um, and then we uh, found electricity and uh, Mr. Edison, among others, um, came up with the electric light bulb. Uh, since then, we've had all sorts of amazing things. We have flashlights. If I can make it work. Yeah, there we go, flashlights. And they come in all sizes. We have the super big work light, really bright. <laughs> and the uh, itty bitty, uh, here it is, headlamp, you know. People look at these like they're funny, but you know, they are super handy when in the right place, <laughs> you know? But it's not very bright at different times. So light is one of those things that uh, we tend to be drawn towards, you know, we can't say we're exactly moths, but we certainly like to have that. And we need it when we uh, um, need to uh, uh, find our way. Um, I've got a couple of stories myself. Uh, when I first moved back to LaGrande in 1997, I went camping behind Mount Harris, and it was a dark, kind of overcast night. And once I turned away from the campfire, it was black. Now, I'd been living in Corvallis for several years at that point, and I was, had found myself unused to the, the, the stillness. And I was probably, I, I, can, I, I can point to that as being the only time I truly was ever really worried about being out in the dark. It was, it was unnerving, to say the least. Um, it's just what it is. But despite the darkness, despite the light that we can through the darkness we encounter, the light that we can build to block it, there's still a, a more powerful light. And this is something I want 
all your kids to remember this more powerful light, and it's the Bible, okay? Um, the Word of God is the lamp. When we encounter darkness in our lives, and I'm not talking that physical where you can't see, but that darkness in our heart where we're feeling down and we know that it just, nothing's going right. We can turn to the, the Bible, and the Bible's Word is a lamp unto our feet, and, we, and it will guide us where we need to go. So that's my lesson for today about light. <laughs> Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you. We thank you so much for your light, for the word that you have given us that is a joy to us. Uh, Lord, you, you lead us there. You um, turn on that light in that word that you give us, and, and uh, it will always Take us to where you need us to be. We thank you, so, Lord, so much for that. In your gracious name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, I believe now it is time for our music worship. So, Rusty and crew, looking forward to this. See if we're still tuned. That's pretty good. Deep. Okay, uh, am I on? Good. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we have the youth group here again, and we have a new guitarist. Toby is playing with us today, um, and Jacob's playing the bass. So um, first song that we're going to do is Faith on Fire. This is a song that was written about 17 years ago for a Pathfinder Campery, and it's just such a good song that it's kind of stayed around. <laughs> We're gonna do it. <clears throat> We're gonna do it the way that they originally did it. So it starts out like this. There's an ember deep within me, but it's only a little flame, but my faith keeps growing stronger, it won't be long till it starts to blaze, set my faith on fire, that's my one desire, make my life a pure and holy flame, so the world can see there's a fire in me burning by the power of Jesus' name. Start a blaze, set my faith, faith on fire. You take one candle, light another, then that other does the same. Before you know it, the world will show it, burning bright with a holy flame. Set my faith on fire, that's my one desire. Make my life a pure and holy flame, so the world can see there's a fire. Power of Jesus' name. 
Next song this morning is Hallelujah. Your love is amazing. Okay, Keith. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah. joy that's growing deep inside of me every time i see you all your goodness shines through i can feel this god song rising up in me hallelujah prayer song this morning is still, I don't know if we've done it once or twice here I think in this church turn my guitar back hide me now under your wings cover Oceans rise and thunders roar. I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. Find rest, my soul.
oceans rise and thunders roar I will soar with you above the storm Father, you are king over the flood I will be still and know you If you were able to, please uh, kneel and join me in prayer. Gracious Lord, we come to you on our knees. We ask you to be here with us, Lord, not just here, but wherever we may go and wherever our people are, Lord. Lord, uh, we do have some requests for you today. We have the need to ask you, Lord, for health. Um, there are several folks that are hurting today that are challenged with health issues, and we ask you to be with them. We think of Judy Hunt, Lord, and her cancer, Carolyn Hinckley as well, and, of course, Linda Clayville. We ask you, Lord, to be with Aura. Rollins and, and the, the challenges she's faced. Uh, we were very heartened to see her at the board meeting a couple weeks ago. Uh, I know it's tough, difficult for her to get out. And we ask you, Lord, to be with her. Lord, we think of uh, people who have or are having uh, some medical procedures done. Uh, we know Terry Robinson had her knees done, and, and Kirk has some surgeries going on. And also we know that... Uh, our conference president, Elder Press, is, uh, has been ill. We ask you, Lord, to be with him. Lord, we uh, also ask for uh, some, some peace in our lives, Lord, that uh, we are challenged at times with, with uh, uh, <laughs> darkness that falls over our heart. Um, we ask you, Lord, to be with uh, uh, Scott Brockton and his family as they are missing their uh, loved one. And uh, be with, uh, um, I know here in our town locally, there's many people uh, from our, our group here that have uh, chosen to attend a, a, a farewell service for a friend, uh, Michelle Sandoval. Uh, Lord, uh, people are hurting and we ask you for peace. And uh, may they find that that light that I spoke of earlier in your word. Uh, Lord, I ask you also to uh, intervene on, on behalf of our church and our school. Uh, and Lord, uh, be with the, the, the leaders and the teachers, help things to finish up in the school year well. Be with the students, Lord, as they attend or are at home and uh, bless their lives, Lord. Lord, we ask you to be also with our community and nation as there's been uh, some unrest here and there um, it seems to be sweeping at times Lord but uh, with you we recognize that all things are possible and we seek the peace that only you can give Lord we uh, we ask you these things and we know that you are hearing um, we that you hear us Lord and uh, uh, we appreciate that so very much we lift you up always Lord in your gracious name we pray amen All right, I guess, uh, Alan, you're up. We're on a lower level uh, as far as the COVID is concerned, and I meet the criteria, so I get to take this thing off up here. I don't have to wear it. What a blessing. <laughs> Last time I spoke, I kept having to pull that thing up all the time, and it was not fun. So anyway, last week, our, my wife and I were over in the Boise area, so we stopped in and seen Dwayne and Connie, and they're doing well. Dwayne's having a lot of health issues, and they're very glad that they had 
made the decision to move over there and leave this church of many years that they were members of. And uh, so they want to send their love to you folks here. Also, today we have a couple visitors from Walla Walla College, Juliana Conrad, who's our niece's daughter. And I'm not sure if that makes her a second niece to us or what. And our friend Jesse Veets, they made the trip over this morning to uh, visit us. And uh, I guess my wife gave them the invitation because I was speaking today, too. So we're, we're glad they can come over and see that there is a lot of beauty outside of Walla Walla, up in the mountains. So thanks for coming. <clears throat> you know, we've seen to have an emphasis on wit witnessing. I think it started with Aura at our elders meeting. She had a devotion, and it was on witnessing. And then Dan Beckner had a sermon a few weeks ago that was really, I thought, an impressive sermon. Does he? And everybody remember what he said we had to remember when we talked to people? What chapter in the Bible were we supposed to let people know about? Matthew 24, Matthew 24. yes, I remember that. <clears throat> and then Jack has been talking to us about witnessing. The Lord has put that on his mind. And, uh, and I'm not sure, but I understand that maybe last week our sermon was on witnessing also. And... Uh, Today I want to talk about witnessing, and this witnessing does not require any money, doesn't require any church board approval, long-term planning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I want to ask a question. How many here have ever watched a Hallmark Christmas movie? Come on, raise your hand. Guys, you can raise your hand too. I have to admit I've watched a few of them. And you know the kind of the general scenario they all have. You have two people, two main actors, a guy and a girl. One of them is usually a high-powered person. They are, they're from the city or a corporation or maybe they even got a prince or something like that. And somehow they're thrown into this small town that's just perfect. Every business has perfect Christmas decorations. All the homes are perfectly decorated, of course, they're Hallmark decorations, but, <clears throat> and the high-powered person usually gets stuck in the town or comes to do some evil thing to the town, and uh, they meet up with the exact opposite. If it's the high-powered person as a, a female, the male is a wood chopper, woodworking, you know, kind of guy, the town handyman or whatever, if it's vice versa, the lady is usually the librarian or the teacher at school or owns some small business. And, of course, they kind of clash at first, but then they <coughs> develop a friendship and it gets more to love. And, and then usually there's a, some misunderstanding and a big breakup. And then everybody's got brought gets back together and the movie ends with a kiss and you think they're going to live for you know have happily ever after <clears throat> but last couple of years there's been a different kind of movie it was it's called the godwink christmas movie and it's produced by kathy lee gifford if you know who she is she's an actress singer she's probably most well known for two things marrying a famous football player, Frank Gifford, and spending 15 years with Regis Philbin, Philbin in that daytime program uh, live with Regis and Kathy at that time. And um, she's a Christian, and she has produced these movies, these Godwink movies. And uh, the I, well, they're based on true life individuals. In fact, at the end of the movie, they actually show the the, the couple that the movie's based on. And uh, the idea behind them are that God arranged circumstances or events to bring these two people together. And it's amazing, some of the events. And then when God is um, given the credit, he kind of winks. God acts like, oh, I didn't do that. But then he winks while he's doing it. So the idea of God wink, that God 
arranged events and circumstances that bring two people together. And they're actually pretty good movies. The others, I can't say much for them. But uh, anyway, I watch them sometimes. And they make millions of dollars, and uh, millions of people watch them. But, uh, and they start about Thanksgiving, and they don't end until <coughs> uh, New Year's. And they go 24-7, because they show the old ones all day long until the new ones come on in the evening. So <coughs> the Godwink uh, movies, and I hope there's a one this year, because I want to watch it again, um, is kind of what I'm talking about today where God, if a person asks and prays, God, bring someone into my life today, God will answer that prayer. And of course, the best example of that is Jesus in the Bible. His whole ministry all day long was meeting people, either going to people or people came to him, and he helped them in uh, every way he can. And how did he do that? Well, Ellen White in the Ministry Healing has a quote about this, and I'm only going to read the very last part. When he, he it talks about how the throngs followed him all day long, or he was always around people. And finally, in the evening when they had departed, they finally got hungry or something, it says, Jesus goes into the mountains, and there alone with God, pours out his soul in prayer for the suffering, sinful, needy ones. And I'm sure his prayer often said, Lord, bring the people I need into my life tomorrow. And, uh, and he did. And what we have in the Gospels is only a small my, fraction of the <clears throat> events that happened in his life, the healing that took place, the witnessing he did. If, we, if they had put everything in the Bible, we probably have to have a wheelbarrow to carry wheel the Bible around. There'd be so many e stories. <clears throat> so there are lots of stories other than Jesus, too. And I'd like to turn to one in Acts 8, recorded in Acts 8. <clears throat> this is a famous story. <clears throat> Acts 8, and it starts on verse 26. Philip was an early evangelist in the church. It says, one day an angel came to him. And the angel said, you need to go somewhere. And I'm sure the uh, eunuch, the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch, had been praying, Lord, bring someone that can explain the Bible to me. So this angel told Philip to go south, down the desert road, it runs from Jews, Jerusalem to Gaza. And so he did, and there he met the treasure of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship and was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. <coughs> and the Holy Spirit told Ethiopia, Philip, go over and walk along beside it. He didn't say go in the carriage, just walk along beside it. And, and of course, the Ethiopian eunuch, what did he do? He invited him up and uh, into the carriage. And as they studied, uh, studied from the book of Isaiah, the eunuch asked Philip, this is verse 34, who was Isaiah talking about, himself or someone else? So Philip began with the same scripture, and there he used many others to tell him about the good news of Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Anytime God puts two people together, always good results uh, come out of it. This is the most interesting, too, part of the story for me. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So Philip, you know, we say Egypt, um, 
that uh, Moses and Elijah were translated to heaven. Well, Philip wasn't translated to heaven, but he was translated some other place. It'd be interesting to talk to Philip in heaven. What happened to you? Where did you end up, you know? Because he was taken away immediately. So God put these two people together. And let's look in Acts 16, another example. <clears throat> this is Paul. Paul had come to Philippi, didn't know anybody there. And so he decided that uh, verse 13, six, chapter 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went a little way outside the city to a river bank where we supposed that some people met for prayer. And we sat down to speak with some women who had come together. So the Lord told them to go down there. One of them was Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of expensive purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. And as she listened to us, the Lord opened her heart. She accepted uh, what Paul was saying. She was baptized with other members of her house and then asked us to be Yes, so she had, she not only, the good result for her was baptism, but for Paul, he got a place to stay. So Paul put himself down there where he could meet people. And uh, so that's another example. I want to do one from the Old Testament. Um, <clears throat> let's look in uh, Genesis 18. Abraham was a tent dweller, and one day he noticed some men standing by. Now, he could have just gone out and waved, but that wasn't Abraham's nature. So he went after them and said, hey, come and be my guest. I'll feed you. And uh, at, at first they were kind of resistant, but they decided to come. And so he prepared a meal. Now, it wasn't a micro microwave meal that took a long time. They had to kill the, the fatted calf and et cetera, et cetera, cook it. And uh, then they gave the meat to the men. And uh, then they began to talk. And I'm sure they were talking all along. And one of the men asked about his wife. And she said, well, she's in the tent. But of course, she was listening into the conversation. And then he gave some good news to the at least to Abraham, that he would have a child in one year from now. Now, Sarah wasn't too uh, excited about the news. What did she do? You remember, anybody remember that story? She laughed, because how old was she? I believe she was like 90 years old, way past childbearing age. And you would have laughed too, all of us would have. But, um, but then Abraham found out their mission, that they were actually angels. Now, he would have never known that if he wouldn't have gone out and met those people. And they were going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot knew, I mean, and, uh, Abraham knew that he had relatives there, and so he tried to bargain with them, bargain it down. He got a bar bargain down. If there were 10 good people, they wouldn't destroy the city. Well, there wasn't 10 good people, but Lot and his family were saved. At least three of them were. And uh, so... Because of Abraham's willingness to go out and meet those people, uh, he was blessed too, and his, even his family was. To me, the, the most striking example of this is found in Luke, of God putting a person in place to do something. Let's look at Luke. I'm sorry, I'm going to go to Mark. <laughs> Mark 15, Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. And it, I just got through studying in Mark, and boy, he just gets to the point. Um, let's look at um, Mark 15, 21. A man named Simon, who was from Serene, was coming in from the country just then. This is the time of... Jesus' crucifixion, and they were carrying their crosses. Now, he, Cyrene is a region in northern Africa, so it was a long journey. And he had got there. He was a Jewish person, and he was there for the Passover. And uh, 
he just got there in time. Friday was the beginning of that. And when he went into Jerusalem, it came about a big crowd of people yelling and saw three men carrying crosses, at least trying to. He must have been a big guy or somehow looked strong because the Roman soldiers uh, forced him to carry Jesus' cross. So he just came right on the scene and he was right away. Now, Ellen White says that he was not a believer in Christ, but because of this experience, he became a believer. In fact, uh, Mark gives uh, some information that none of the other gospel uh, writers do at the very end of that chapter, or that verse. It says, Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. So his sons must have been believers, but he was not, and because of that, uh, the experience of carrying Jesus' cross, he became a believer in Jesus. In fact, we use that term in a Christian world to bear the cross of Jesus. Anybody know what that means? When you say, oh, that person's bearing the cross of Jesus. I had to look that up too. I've heard that. Uh, bearing the cross of Jesus is by remaining true to principle in face of unpopular views or slights or personal bad remarks or abuse heaped on you for standing true to your principle. I think Noah would be a good example of that for 120 years. People abused and mocked him and made all kinds of fun of him. So he bore Christ's cross before Christ, before Simon bore the cross of Jesus. <coughs> so the Bible is full of all these examples. We could be here all day, but I'm going to get on to some more modern today examples. I read a story recently in um, the lesson quarterly, the adult lesson quarterly last quarter, about a pastor in Russia. And I'll kind of paraphrase or talk through this without reading it. Him and his wife were on a trip to go to the Black Sea vacation, and it was about a thousand miles. After about 10 hours of driving, all of a sudden his car started making all this racket. Now, now I don't know about you, but boy, when my car has problems, I hate it, you know, I'm not a mechanical. Some people look at that as a challenge, I don't. But anyway, his start starts banging, banging, making all kinds of noise. He got out, stopped the car like any of us would, looked at everything over, everything looked fine, kept going down the road. It even got louder and louder. And now they were about uh, 800 miles into their trip, and they thought, well, I can't turn around and go back. <clears throat> uh, we'll just have to keep going. They prayed, prayed about it, and kept going. The car kept making this racket. And about at that time, suddenly a little voice said, Stop at that mechanic shop over there. And he looked, and there was one there. He drove in. <clears throat> and I know if you drive into a mechanic shop and you're on the road, the first thing you wonder is, are they so busy they're not going to be able to help me? Or will it be days before they'll be able to get to me? So he goes inside, and there are two guys in there, and they're just standing there talking to each other. So he tells them his problem. They go out and look it over. They look it all over. They rotate the tires. They really didn't find anything wrong. And so they said, you can go. We've done what we can. And he said, how much is it? And he said, 200 rubles, which is only like four bucks or something. So he went to this car, got the money, put it inside a book. He happened to have a book uh, on the Gospel of John. So he took the book and would put the money inside and gave it to the, these two guys. And here I'll read the very last couple sentences here. The mechanic's face lit up with joy. They took the 200 rubles out of the book and returned it to him. He, one of them held up the book. God sent this book to us, he said. We were just talking about God when you arrived. So there's a God moment right there where he, and he didn't have any problems after he left the shop. His, his car worked fine. <clears throat> Last, uh, I'm going to tell a couple of experiences we had recently. Last, uh, we go south in the wintertime, 
And one of the, our favorite places to stay is down in the Salton Sea area of California. It's out in Southeast California in the desert. It's below sea level, so it's one of the warmest places you can find in the wintertime. And uh, one of the reasons we like to go there is there's lots of activities and there are lots of hot water, pools and stuff and uh, activities going on. And off the park there, they have all kinds of hiking trails, walking trails. Anywhere, some of them are one mile, some of them are eight miles long, and some of them go up in the mountains, some just go out in the desert, up and over hills and down little canyons. And <clears throat> so every morning you can uh, decide which way you want to go. Do you want to face the sun? Do you want the sun on your back or et cetera? And so every morning I take a walk and I go out on one of these trails. It's kind of neat way to do it. Well, one day I was coming back I have, and I walk with walking sticks. So I was coming back towards the, my motor home in the park. And I heard this yelling behind me. And I turned around and I thought, what's the guy? There's some guy running down the road. And I should back up and say, I had been praying that I'd be able to meet somebody that I could witness to. So I thought, what did I do to disturb that guy? You know, Maybe my walking sticks were too loud. Anyway, he came running up and he says, hey, I'm Roy. And I'm new here, and I'd like to walk with somebody. I, I'd like a walking partner. And I said, well, I go out every morning, and uh, I'll come by tomorrow morning. I go out at 6.30, about 6.30, I'll come by, and if you're ready, we'll go. And sure enough, he was ready, and we started walking together. Of course, the first day, you find out who he is, and he finds out who I am, and I find out he is a Jewish uh, liberal Jewish atheist from Los Angeles. And he finds out I'm a, as he would say, a fundamental Christian, Bible-believing Christian. So here we are, two exact opposites. And of course, being a Jewish person, he was well-versed in the Old Testament, especially the Torah, the first five. And so we had lots of discussions on these trips. And we hiked for a long six weeks in Almost every morning we went out and we even did some very long hikes during the day together. He was so appreciative and excited about uh, hiking together. But our conversations were what it was all about, really. And we had lots of conversations. He was in the history and uh, uh, also health. He was very much in the health and eating properly. He had recently lost 100 pounds and he, he was a workout addict and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so we had lots of good discussions. And I told him <coughs> that our, our church, uh, there's a number of Seventh-day Adventists go there. We have church and Sabbath school every week and also midweek services, and et cetera. And I told him, we <coughs> well, he asked one day, could I attend your services? Of course, being a Seventh-day Adventist, a Sabbath keeper, you know, he knew about the Sabbath being Jewish. Um, I said, sure, and I was told him I was going to be teaching a lesson on Isaiah. And we were studying Isaiah that during that time. So he came, and he took, brought his notepad, <coughs> notepad and, <coughs> and uh, <coughs> he stayed for church and potluck. <coughs> we, were, we were having potlucks. I said we might be the only ones having potlucks anywhere in America. But uh, so after the next day, it was interesting, he called me up and said, I want to get, get together with you and go over what we discussed yesterday. And so we spent an hour on Sunday going over Isaiah. Well, I, he told me one time, you know, he says, I had a stereotypical uh, idea of what a fundamentalist Christian was like. He says, I'm changing my ideas on that because you're not like that. And I had a kind of a, a, my own feeling about people like him, atheist and secular and so on. And um, they're open too. And when it came time for us to leave, I wanted to give him a great controversy. But I didn't have one, no one in our group did. And I thought, oh boy, I don't have one. I'll have to send one when I get home. But a couple days before we were to leave, we were waiting in line. They have a guy that brings produce to this 
park and you can go down and buy fruits and vegetables, etc. And uh, here come this lady that I recognized from years past. She used to come to our group, our Adventist group there, but I hadn't seen her this year. And so I got to talking with her and uh, she's from Oregon. A number of people there are from Oregon. It's amazing how many Oregon people are, are there. But she uh, told me that her and her husband had a ministry. Uh, Mexico is very close to this park. It's probably 30, 40 miles away. And they go, they have a whole bunch of Spanish great controversies and they go to Mexico into Mexicali and give out Spanish great controversies. And I said, well, you don't happen to have an English one, do you? And she said, sure, I have one and I'll bring it by this afternoon. So that afternoon she brought me an English, English great controversy and then she gave me a Spanish one. I thought, well, what am I gonna do with that? I stuck it up in the cupboard in the motorhome and gave the other one to Roy and we're in, still in communication with each other. He had a real interest in Vietnam because Vietnam had done very well in the COVID, during the COVID crisis of handling. He wants to go there. I told him I'd like to go back there <coughs> some sometime. So who knows, we might go together. But uh, so we communicate from time to time, both through texting. And uh, so hopefully next year I'll be able to uh, follow up. You know, whether he'll ever be converted, I don't know. But I think we've cha I've changed his ideas about fundamentalist Christians. And that's the most important thing. But there's more to the story. I had that Spanish great controversy. What am I going to do with that? Well, we went over to Arizona from there. And we fell in with a group that was going down into Mexico. And we were wanting to go to Mexico. But we kind of hesitated, especially in the COVID. But they were going, and so we joined up with them and went and spent a week in Mexico. And while we were there, they were hauling us around in vans to different places. And we had a young man, uh, Alberto, who was in our van. We stayed in the same vans. And he was such a nice guy, and he was helpful, get, helping us get in and out. And he couldn't speak English, and we couldn't speak Spanish. But that's not a problem anymore down there because everybody has a cell phone, so you speak in the English and it translates for him or he speaks the Spanish and translates to in the English. So it really makes it a lot easier now. So I told my wife, you know, if we got that Spanish great controversy, I want to give it to him. So I did. And uh, he was, you know, appreciative. And the next day when they took us somewhere and then everybody got out, he called me over and he had, <coughs> But there was a text there from him saying, hello, my name is Al uh, Alberto Corona, is the last name, but he, Corona was not pronounced that way. And he said, I was, grew up in a Christian home, but I've left Christianity. And I'm so thankful for this book, and I want to be able to uh, study it. And he wanted my email address, and so I gave it to him. I have never heard from him an email, but I thought, well, the Lord has a plan, you know. Why did she give me that Spanish great controversy? I don't know, but the Lord knew I needed it. And so I was very thankful. Uh, this two examples of how the Lord can work in our lives when we ask him to put somebody into our, our sphere of influence. So that's a, that's a wonderful way for myself. I just got to remember to pray that every day. Lord, bring someone in my life today that I can witness to. Many times I forget to even do that. So <clears throat> I think we need to be doing those on an individual basis, and that'll help not only ourselves to grow spiritually, but it'll help others, and it'll help our church too. So I hope this morning that you'll, um, if you haven't been doing this, that you'll consider doing it, and may the Lord bless you, and we just thank you and know that your elders and there's other leaders in this church that are praying on a regular basis that our church will be successful. And when we get our new pastor, the right person will be here to help lead our church. And we just know the Lord is working. He is working. And, uh, and a lot of prayers are being asked, prayed for our church. So let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Lord, we just thank you that you've been with us. You've blessed us. And you've blessed each one of us. You've given us health. Lord, and you've protected us, a lot of us, from the, the COVID. 
and we just thank you for that. And so, Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless our church, our community, our families, and continue to give us the strength and the wisdom to know what's right and how to share you. We ask it all in your name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and give you his peace this week. Thank you for coming.